Okay, it's recording. Um, so you can begin, Cheryl, if you're ready. Okay, so is it just Carmen today? Anybody else on? Um, not right now. People usually jump on um, throughout, like usually within like the first five to 10, 15 minutes. Um, oh, okay, because I know you can decide not to share a video of yourself. So I, I was just checking to see oh, if there was no. more than one person. Okay, well, um, I guess I'll just talk slow. So if somebody jumps on late, they don't miss too much. But the topic today is transferable skills. And so uh, we're going to at first talk about what we mean by transferable. Uh, one thing to note about transferable skills is that they are um, useful no matter what the job is. That's why sometimes they're also called portable skills because you learn these things, you're sometimes not just from a job. Sometimes they're things you've learned from volunteer experiences or just through the course of everyday life. And um, they're, they're things that are so helpful to have on your resume. They're really good examples of what we call keywords. Keyword resume might be a term that's familiar to you. A lot of employers use different software packages that more or less scan the resumes looking for these keywords to see how good of a match their job description is to your resume. And things like these transferable skills will help float your resume up to the top to um, you know, have, have the most, that's what they're looking for, which resumes have the most hits in terms of these keywords that they're looking for. And so um, hopefully this will either help you uh, write your resume or maybe give the resume you have a second thought and you can give it a little power boost by incorporating some of these skills in your resume. So the learning objectives, we are going to identify and talk about different skill categories as far as being able to determine what those are for you. I'm going to give you a couple of websites. Liz is going to email them after the workshop so you'll you'll have a link you don't have to worry about writing writing it down uh, one of them is pretty lengthy but you'll have those links and i my hope is that you'll be inspired uh, through our talk this morning to go out on your own and uh, explore a couple of these websites actually you could just google transferable skills and there's a wealth of information out there but i want you to be able to locate some checklists of of these skills uh I, I think it'll make it easier for you to brainstorm to be able to determine yes i can do that um, i love to do that and sometimes you'll see some skills that intrigue you you've just never had a chance to experience them yet and maybe those will be something you could use as a goal, something that maybe you could work on or, or learn more about so that you could incorporate it in your resume at some point. So there are three types of skills that we want to define. The transferable skills I've already mentioned. And again, these are skills that are useful and relevant no matter what your job is. For instance, uh, time management or organizing, uh, those those are skills that it doesn't matter whether you are a customer service employee or you are working at a library or some, some kind of office job, organizing and organizing your resources and managing your time are very important skills to have, even though those were just three very different examples of jobs I mentioned. Self-management skills, these are your ability to handle yourself in different work environments. Uh, sometimes it also can be a determination of the kinds of jobs you're attracted to. For instance, if you're a very, very extroverted social people person, 
maybe jobs where you're going to be in a cubicle all day without much contact with anyone might be draining for you. It might be something that wouldn't be a good fit for you. However, on the other hand, if you're someone who really needs that alone, quiet time to be able to concentrate and work more efficiently, well then, maybe you would be wanting to really take a look when you go to the interview at the work environment, uh, maybe even consider a working at home position if you really prefer to work more alone. It also has to do with how you handle yourself in, um, in challenging situations. If you have a rude customer or you have a manager that is a micromanager and um, you know, you just, you know, throughout your life experience already that it's, it's harder to get along with certain people based on your personality style and based on their personality style. And so being able to, um, to manage yourself under challenging circumstances is, is, are also skills that we develop. Then the third, work content skills. This is, these are skills that are very specific to that employer. For instance, they have um, a certain software program that you'll be using to get your job done. Uh, you would have to learn that specific software. And in the future, if you leave and take a different job, you wouldn't, you wouldn't use that software anymore. Uh, it still doesn't mean it shouldn't go on your resume. It's just something that that you don't dwell on and, you know, it, it's listed under the employment section of your resume. If they ask a question or there's something important about it that you want them to know, you briefly talk about it, but it's, um, it's definitely nothing that you could take with you to the next employer. So then the strongest skills you have in each of these three categories are really important in your career development. Uh, but these transferable skills are the ones that you can really use to market yourself. They're the constant factors that you can rely on no matter where you're working. So with that in mind, let's take a look at a more specific example. So here's three different skill types. On the left hand side, the ones that the ones that we just the terms that we just um, defined. And then an example on the right hand side. So again, transfer, a transferable skill example, one would be time management. And um, this is something also, of course, you know, it, would, it could be in your resume as one of your strengths, but then something that you could really talk about too. That for, for instance, um, maybe you've been noted for having excellent time management skills on past performance reviews. Those past performance reviews, if you can get your hands on them, if you could contact an employer that is still in business, that uh, you know the, the HR department is typically more than happy. Uh, but, you know, files typically go way back, at least seven to ten years, and they they can you know usually get their hands on it pretty easily, even if it's well, most people are putting everything elect you know, scanning documents and everything's electronic. So most companies can get their hands on it pretty quickly for you. Could be in a file box, may take a while, but usually most employers are pretty agreeable about trying to, to get those to you. They're real helpful for writing your resume and for jogging your memory about different situations that you were really noted as a high achiever and it'll give you some some good things to talk about because you know you want to be a storyteller when you're on an interview so you want to give examples then um, a self-management skill perhaps related to time management if you're really good at managing your time that probably means you value a structured work environment where you have a to-do list and you have things mapped out at certain times of the day and it's important uh, to, in order to do the work efficiently, that it is a very structured work environment. That would be, that would be something that uh, you could probably pat yourself on the back for. That you are, 
you, you very much thrive in a structured environment. Um, a work content, content skill specific to the subject of time management would be being able to use a software program like Microsoft Outlook. Uh, most companies, it is what everyone's still using for email, but there's a lot more to Outlook than that. You know, there's the calendar and, um, the, and the task lists. Most of us don't use the task lists, at least not to the extent that that we could. They're very powerful. They're very, it's very, uh, very helpful. But at least most of us use the email and the calendar. And it's easy, you know, to drag an email over to your calendar. And um, I, I know um, I, I love when I'm able to work where I have two screen, two monitors, and I'll usually have my, you know, my calendar open at least on a partial screen almost all day to glance, to glance at things and see what's coming up. Okay, more about, let's see, hmm, I think my screen's frozen. Can you guys hear me? Yep, I yes. can hear you. Okay. For some reason, my PowerPoint, let me try to, let me stop share and then get back into it. Okay. Sorry about that. Oh, you're fine. It froze. Well, don't you love technology? <laughs> I was just telling Liz before the class that um, I've got a baby sleeping in the next room, my granddaughter, and don't be surprised if she starts crying or my dog starts barking. Okay, let, let me try this again. Can you guys see that? Um, no. Are you sharing it? I thought so. Let me see. It's okay. I always forget to. <laughs> I think I hit share and then I didn't. I know. Yep. See ya. Okay, good. This is what keeps happening when I share it. Oh, wait. Okay. Okay. Un unstuck now. <laughs> Excuse me. Another, another really useful exercise to do to tap into what your transferable skills are is to think back what Think back on what you used to just love to do as a little person. These are often the best source. These memories are often the very best source for discovering what you're good at. Because it's not only important to be in tune with what you're good at, but also what you love doing. We often a term that's used for these skills are we like to call them your motivated skills. Not only are you very proficient, you love to do it. You get energized by doing it. So for instance, on this screen, here we have this little girl and she always loved to build things with blocks or Legos or what have you. It's just something that always made her happy. She was good at it. She'd spend a lot of time doing it. And then lo and behold, she grows up and she ends up being one of the lucky fortunate people to tap in to what she really truly loves doing, studied it, and now it looks like I would say she's some sort of architect or some sort in some sort of design work. These again, they show up early in life, and sometimes we just take it for granted. You know, maybe you have a, a real knack for music, but you just take it for granted. You think, oh, you know, everyone, everyone can play the piano or everyone can sing. 
well, perhaps maybe you were destined to be a music teacher. You know, you just, it, it depends on, um, you know, every, they're going to be just unique for every, every single person. And it's just, it's only something that you can determine. But in addition to various assessments and things that you can, that you can do, read about, take a, an assessment, also going back and dwelling on what you really love to do can be very insightful. So in this instance, her transferable skill was using mechanical abilities and being very good at that. This is what we call a transferable skill wheel. And what we do is we take a transferable skill and then we brainstorm what, what are some of the different things that, that I could do and get paid for that, uh, that incorporate organizing. So here's an example where, and, and you, could, you could have way more than the four I'm suggesting here. You could go on and on with this. But for instance, if you are very good at organizing and you like that kind of process, working in inventory. You know, all different kinds of businesses have inventory, retail, manufacturing, and it's very important to have that inventory very well organized so they know when they need to reorder or when they need to start manufacturing more of something. So inventory control is, um, is, a, is one example event planning a lot of companies hire event planners i actually that was one of my jobs a few years ago i worked at iupui and i helped put together all these events for the new professors who were trying to get tenured they had to go to all sorts of training classes and and then we also had a lot of different social events so they could network and meet other people in different departments and um, uh, hotels are another example of um, a business that hires event planners because you know people book hotels for things like weddings and family reunions and class reunions and so most hotels um, have event planners. Administrative assistant, that is a job that is pretty much organizing people and things you know from eight to five you're helping whoever you report to you're helping them with their calendar and appointments and scheduling rooms and uh, sending reminders to people it's it's all day organizing home organizer uh, that's actually a job i wish i could afford to hire one myself i mean there are people that typically they are self-employed and you can hire them to come in and organize your kitchen drawers, organize your closets. It's, I, I, have you heard of, uh, oh, I'm forgetting her first name now, very popular, Kondo is her last name, Marie Kondo. And uh, she wrote a book called uh, the, Something About Tidying Up. And she has a Netflix series. And that's what she does. She goes into people's homes and she helps them um, get, you know, decide things to donate to charity or to sometimes just throw away and uh, then how to reorganize those rooms. So it's, it's actually a very popular uh, occupation and right now. Anybody uh, have any other examples of, of a position where organizing would be a good skill to, to have and to showcase on your resume? Teaching? is another one you have to grade the papers plan out the lessons okay. here's an example of a checklist you find a lot of these things on the internet where you can um, print it out and then go through the different skills and check them if you've had experience with it. But then what I always recommend doing, just having experience at it doesn't necessarily mean it's something you really want to showcase on your resume. If you don't like doing it, you know, you're burned out on it. 
you don't want to get pigeonholed. Yeah, maybe you're very good at customer service, but boy, at the end of the day, you were just drained. You really didn't like dealing with people on the phone all day, particularly the rude ones. Well, certainly it's something that's going to appear in your employment history, but it's probably not something that you want to have up in your objective or, or anything that you want to spend a great deal of time, you know, convincing them at what, how good you are at that, because you'll just get slotted into the same old position where you're go going to be doing that all day. So when you get online, which I hope you do, and find some of these different transferable skill checklists, and the one that um, I'm sending you a link to one that IUPUI has on in their uh, liberal arts department. Each school at IUPUI, well, at any university, each, the bigger universities, each school has their own career development office. And this one happens to be online for you know anyone to see. You don't have to be enrolled in that school. And they've developed these this set of skills. It again, it's every list you see is going to be a little different. So it's it's going to take a little time uh, to Google around. Maybe maybe this one I found at the IU School of Liberal Arts resonates with you. Maybe it doesn't. Uh, get on and you know and find find some other sources. Sometimes they're just one word. Um, you know, negotiate. Uh, train. Sometimes they're little phrases. Uh, work with numbers. Uh, if you're good at working with numbers, that could be that could be a lot of different positions. Cashiering, good at you know good at giving back change and working with tricky combinations of of money that people give you, or bookkeeping, um, filing. You know a lot a lot of you know numerical files. So. Um, I really encourage you to, to do a little research and try to find some sort of checklist or inventory. That might be another good Google phrase, uh, transferable skills inventory, and, and see what pops up that you think would be good. I was trying to look for a, some sort of online assessment. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't successful finding very many. Um, I, I, I did find, and again, you'll get this website in an email. Um, let's see. It's called Indiana Career Explorer. And you see the, the website underneath there. And that's the link that Liz is going to send. You can create an account. Some people have, have automatic um, ties to this already if, if you've ever enrolled. In fact, I went to create an account and I was already on there and probably I'd created an account and just forgot about it in conjunction with a position I had um, many years ago uh, doing career, um, career management at Indiana Farm Bureau. I probably created an account for myself so that I could show uh, the participants in my workshops. So um, if it says that your email address is already being used, Maybe you have had stumbled um, on it before through a school or other training. Um, they just they'll do, they just let you reset your password and you're good to go. But they do have some um, some good assessments on here. I really I highly recommend it. Um, and also, if you're a Workforce One client, I believe you may automatically be enrolled in this. But it's a very uh, robust site. And they, they definitely have uh, a section dedicated to uh, transferable skills on here that I think you'll find really helpful. So, again, back to what I mean by motivated skills. Think about the thing, you know, the things you've learned to do. And again, don't don't um, sell yourself short. It could, it could be things you've learned, you know, just through home, your own home organization, volunteering, 
something you learn to do in a school or training situation. It doesn't have to be something you've done for an employer. And then when you've been able to put the work in and come up with a good inventory of what those skills are, then, then do a second inventory of what are the activities that you've really enjoyed and have felt proud of because those are the ones you're going to really want to have. They say there's a good rule of thumb that says anything that you really want that employer, that person interviewing you to know, have it up at the top third or so of your resume. You're going to have a section of your resume that's really um, any more, unless you're really looking for a specific, specific type of position, rather than saying job objective, I like to recommend people have a career summary up at the top of, and call, call it that career summary or something similar to that, where it's a little broader and you're talking and you that's your place to really shine. And then usually there'll be some sort of keyword uh, summary under that where you'll have, and that's exactly where you'll have these um, transferable skills mentioned like perhaps, you know, multitasking, customer service, you know, nothing that's particular to a specific employer, but things that you uh, feel are strengths of yours. So I, I hope this has been a good enough explanation to help you um, get on, get on the research path to uh, assess what these what these skills are for you. Um, can I? It, it's so hard to do. I just wish we were all together. It's so it's so much uh, easier to work with each other and give each other ideas when we're face to face. But um, without that, I guess I'll turn it over back to you and see. Are are there some specific? Um, questions or maybe even other topics you want to talk about related to your skill set and putting together a resume, getting ready for an interview. I have a question, Cheryl. Sure. I'm going to... So on your third bullet point down, you have burnout skills. Uh, jog my memory. Where did that show up in your presentation or how do you mean that? Which of your burnout skills? I kept this slide because I wanted to talk about, about it, but actually, it, had we been face to face, I actually have these decks of cards, and each card has a different transferable skill on it. And I, I give people about 20 minutes or so to sort through the cards. And first, we sort them from top to bottom things I love to do all the way down to things that I'm just not motivated to do. And then we sort them again. So it ends up looking like a spreadsheet. We sort them again by spreading them out as to what our experience level was highly proficient down to, I have no experience with this. And you end up with this quadrant where in the top left-hand corner, they are things you're highly proficient at and you, it, you totally enjoy doing them. Those are the motivated skills. In the bottom left-hand corner, you have things you're highly proficient at, but you no longer enjoy doing them. You're not motivated. And then that's what we call our burnout skills. Things we're good at, but we don't like to do them anymore. For instance, in my own, in my own career, um, not having the, um, the luxury of a of a mentor or someone to really help guide me to decide what I wanted to do. I was fortunate enough to go to college, but I was floundering. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. I actually ended up taking the, an accounting class just because uh, whoever was signing us up for classes at the time suggested I might want to try it. I was good at it. Got an A. Took more classes. Ended up changing my major to accounting. But never ask myself, do I really do I really like this? Am I am I enjoying it? 
to a certain extent, if you're good at it, you do enjoy it because there's a source of pride. But when I got out of there into the world of work, oh my goodness, it just wasn't, you know, it just wasn't a good fit for me. I, so at first I tried auditing. I went with a public accounting firm and we would go to all these different businesses and do audits. And I thought, well, maybe I don't like it because I, I, I would prefer to have my own desk. I don't like working out of a briefcase and you know sometimes they put you back you know in the in a warehouse you know freezing cold uh supply room or you know i thought maybe that's why i don't like this because i just i just want to go to the same place every day and have a have a nice work environment so then i tried tax accounting and liked that a little better but oh my goodness the hours were crazy and you know during tax season and once I started having children it's like oh this isn't a good fit and then I tried a few more different private accounting jobs and sometimes I stayed for a long time because I really liked the people but I was finally given the opportunity and it was all because of a what and he's, he's still one of my best friends a co-worker and we were at uh we were at I was working in a trust department at a bank and so was he as an administrative uh, person. And all the banks were starting to gobble each other up. This is back in the 90s. And um, we had gone through our fifth merger. And finally, uh, they weren't going to keep us. Uh, a bank, bank One had bought us at that time. And they were also a big presence in Indianapolis. I was with Indiana National Bank, except we kept changing names. And uh, just we could, both big trust departments right in the same, across, literally across the street from each other, were not going to survive. And so they let all of us go. And uh, so the bank started this outplacement department and um, to help people do the resumes and learn interviewing skills. And... Um, and um, that was, you know, just going to be temporary. So until, you know, they got, a, until they helped all the people that were downsized, and then that was going to be it. So none of our HR people applied for those jobs because they thought, well, yeah, this is a temporary project, and then I'm not going to have a job. And so Tom is his name. Tom and I were talking, and I knew I liked presenting and, and training because I, I, I actually, one of the other, other things I did as an accountant is I taught accounting courses at Ivy Tech and, and, I, and International Business College. And I love that, but it was just impossible. It's, it's hard to get, get on full time. They, they just hire adjunct instructors for those, for those kinds of jobs. So I really needed health care and other benefits. So I, I only did that for about three years, but I, I did love it. And so I thought, yeah, this could, you know, we could, we could, apply for these jobs, learn the skills for making sure our own resumes were in order and our own interview skills were polished and sharpened and, you know, and, and feel good about helping other people along the way. And then when it was done, it was done and our resumes would be ready for our own job search. Well, we, we both just fell in love with the work. And so um, I, I just decided to leave accounting, you know, it was beyond a burnout skill. You know, I couldn't hardly get out of bed in the morning to do it anymore. So uh, I left it behind and it was hard because I put so much time and money going to school and I even had passed the CPA exam, but I left it all behind and I went into the career management field and I ended up uh, doing it for several years at um, Farm Bureau Insurance. It's, it's a good, um, it's a good HR offering to have for employees because you want to retain them. And so if they get burned out in their current job, you want to be able to help them discover their strengths. And uh, so we would, we would do all kinds of assessments with our employees to help them discover their personality types and their interests and their values and, um, and, and you know, what, what sort of work would be a good fit for them. So that was a long story, but that, but that's what we mean about burn. It's a skill. You're good at it. it. It's just not anything, you know, and sometimes you have to bite the bullet and you need a job. You just have to do it. But to know that about yourself and to be on the lookout for ways you can find um, opportunities 
to use the skills you really love to do. Developmental skills, that last one, these would be things that you think you would really love to try. You just never had a chance to try it before. Like maybe public speaking or, or working with numbers. So that's what we mean. I, and that's why I left that slide up, even though we weren't going to be able to play with the deck of cards today. I wanted to keep that slide in here so that we could talk about the difference between skills that you really want to use versus ones you don't. So for instance, applying that to a resume, once I decided to leave accounting behind, um, I, I quit even putting those jobs on my resume because I, I, I had to wait until many years went by. But actually they say, you don't have to go back any more than 10 or 15 years. For one reason, you want to keep your resume to no more than two pages. So eventually, you just can't fit everything on there anymore. But also, like I had the bank job. I just didn't mention, um, you know, I, I mostly mentioned the career management. I, 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 we ended up, it didn't end up being so temporary after all. We ended up uh, staying open for three years. We got to do the career management outplacement work for three years there. And so I just emphasized all of that and um, left off all my public accounting jobs and all, all those early, early, early things I did right out of college. Wow, that, that's excellent. Thank you. I'm glad I asked that question because you gave me a whole new insight. Um, I think sometimes in my job search, even though I have opportunities to maybe go into a new career area that I thought that I might enjoy at one time, sometimes the anxiety, I'll say it, <laughs> or the feeling of pressure that, oh my goodness, starting from the bottom again, you know, and working my way up to any type of uh, pay that would cover my needs, there's a little bit of pressure there and going back to, okay, I know I can get a paycheck doing this, but yeah, you really helped me so much regarding where's my passion. And that was something that came up in one of my uh, previous positions as the department was changing to something completely different. They said they were really intent on looking for people that had a passion for what the new department would be doing. So it reminds me of how important it will be for me to have a clear assessment of my passions because that does really come out when either I'm being interviewed for a job and they're looking for someone that has a true passion for doing it or when I'm doing the job for a while and like you said, <laughs> getting burnt out on doing the thing that maybe you went to school and paid a lot of money to learn how to do. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And if, if they ever ask you in an interview, you know, how do you know that's your passion or why is that your passion? I think the best way I've ever answered it is because I am so energized. When, when I'm teaching all day, I, you know, I'm driving home and I'm thinking back on on things we did in the classroom and um, you know I'm just I've just got a smile on my face all the way home wasn't like that with the county <laughs> at all so when you feel energized at the end of the day that that's how you know you want it you can't wait to go back and do that what sort of work um, have you done Carmen oh wow um, let's see here so I have done research at IUPUI, I did that for 11 years in neuroscience. So when you said IUPUI, that brought a smile to my face because I really enjoyed the learning part. I also enjoyed the mentoring part of having new people that we were training in the lab. We knew they would be there for approximately two years. Most of them came in wanting to go to medical school. So they would do research with us for about two years so that they could put that on their resume and be able to hopefully get in to medical school. And then from there, I went to work for a pharmaceutical company where I negotiated clinical trial budgets for six years. And um, 
Yeah, you talked about the performance reviews, and that's something that the companies that I worked for, they didn't necessarily want to give out, but I made a little note to myself there it that hurt to ask. Yeah, and I won't forget in the future to going forward, keep those make, documents. Yeah, make copies. Make copies. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I've done in the past. And um yeah, Sounds but like finding that's something a very strong skill set. Well, th this workshop has helped me so much because, again, it's brought back to my thinking, what are the things that I enjoy doing? And just even your explanation of passion there, the thing that energized me, that is so true because that's the thing that I could enjoy doing and I would have to set myself on a time clock to say, okay, I'm going to end by whatever time of the night or whatever time of the day <laughs> because sometimes I'd overdo the thing that I enjoyed doing because it didn't feel like work right right so thank you oh you're welcome did anyone else end up joining Liz Gloria did hi Gloria do you have any questions thank you Yes, I'm here. I didn't have any questions, but um, just more so a comment. Um, I really appreciated the presentation and I've been liking all the workshops so far. I think this really helps to encourage individuals getting back into the workforce um, and giving them some very detailed, in-depth knowledge on how to um, go about getting back into the workforce. Um, I did have a question to know if any of the workshops that are planned going forward will have any discussion about um, negotiating pay as um, when you are getting into those positions because one issue I've ran into is you know your worth, you know that you're very capable of doing a job, but sometimes you are scared to negotiate a, a different amount of pay and like skills to how to combat that and how to go into an interview or an opportunity to negotiate a good wage. Definitely. Um, I don't know if we're going to cover that in this series, but I can ask Tiffany because I think that's a great topic. Um, I've come across that as well in my experience and it's never, um, I never know how to start that either. So that would be. Yeah, you know, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely a topic. It might not have its own workshop, but it gets touched on in the interviewing. Uh, and also, you know, you're available, well, I don't know when we'll be able to do face-to-face -face appointments, but I think Dress for Success has a plan going forward for when like you'll be doing appointments with people i think july 7th we're thinking um we'll have in person um workshops you can make an appointment with tiffany and do some one-on-one -on -one, like like practice you know and i mean it does and it doesn't have to be role play it could be i i suppose if you wanted to but you, you could run by her um what you know how you think you would handle the, the salary question. I will tell you just uh, just quick, just briefly because I know we're running up to almost an hour. Try to try to not be the person to bring it up first. I, um, don't sell yourself short for sure. I, that's oh man. I, I this is not anything I've ever been good at either. I think as women, um, we tend to just be more submissive in that conversation for whatever reason. Like, we're just thankful to have the job. I don't know, but I, I, I don't know very many women who say they are excellent at negotiating a salary. So don't feel like it's you alone. We all struggle with this. But they say you, you want the employer to think that what's most important to you is, is this gonna be a good fit? What do you need? And I have the skills you you need and, and it's going to be a good fit make that be the highlight of the conversation usually um 
they will bring it up, maybe not at the first interview, but, but just don't you be the one to bring it up first. And they'll say, well, what kind of salary are you looking for? And don't be very specific. Um, uh, I don't. You, you can, again, you can Google salary negotiation and read all kinds of good articles, and you'll come up with a way to phrase it that, that matches your personality. But basically, you want the reply to be something along the lines of, well, I've, you know, I've, I, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure, you know, you, I, w I would, I want to be paid fairly based on my experience and, and, um, and show them that you've done some research. Real good website. It's called salary.com and skip through the ads. You're going to get all kinds of little ads that try to entice you. Oh, for $9.99. None, click here and you can have the premium version. You don't need it. Just click through all that and get on salary.com and you're able to put in the zip code so you could get salary information for a certain job title um, for our area of, of the Midwest. And, you know, again, it's zip code driven. So even for Indianapolis and it'll give you a range. It'll give you a low, mid and high range, but make sure um, you put in a good job title because sometimes it'll there'll, there'll be things like administ administrative assistant one two three and you know if you, you've, you've got to be honest with yourself and you know how experienced are you if, if you're a if you're a beginner in the career then you're gonna you're gonna want to put in that level one job description and get that range but if you truly have the years of experience under your belt don't sell yourself short and go with the level two or the level three, and, you know, but make sure you read the description carefully. And then, and then you can get, you know, if, cause they'll press you. They'll, they'll want to know because if you're out of their range, they don't want to waste your time or their time. But, but if, you know, if you give a range, a wide enough range, you're not going to hurt yourself and you still put it back on them to make, to, you know, the, but a, a, I don't know. They, I've been on the HR side of things for five years with a manufacturing company. And I'll tell you, it's so hard. It really is hard to find good people that, you know, you just know, you, you just hit it off with them or you don't. And I would say most HR people I know really don't try to lowball people. They don't want to, I, I, they're out there. I'm not going to say it never happens, but they want to give you a figure that's going to be enough to make you say yes. You know, if they want you, they want you to say yes. So don't be afraid to, uh, to not give that lowest of the low numbers because they'll, they'll make you an offer hoping you'll, you know, hoping you'll say yes. And don't be afraid to come back with, well, I've, you know, if, you know, I've had people do that all the time. And I usually either meet them halfway or if, to tell you the truth, if I'm really, really desperate, I'll, I'll give it to them. So it's, they're just, sometimes they're just as nervous as you are on the other side because they really want you to say yes and they're afraid they're going to turn you off with, with a low ball figure. Thank you. I just went, ran, I just rambled on and on on that one. No, it's really helpful. Um, does anybody else have any more questions? I do have one more question. Um, I wanted to be really clear on where Cheryl is suggesting that we include the comments about transferable skills. I have my resume set up where it shows the um, professional summary and then my key skills and then my professional experience. So where in there do you believe it's the best place get to uh, weave in the verbal skills? You know what, I'm gonna to try to screen share again and show you an example, a resume example here. <clears throat> and I also wanted to share that on a few of the other workshops, I think that CC did um, with Dress for Success, we did address or she did address the uh, salary negotiation 
and um, how to approach that with comments, just like you did, Cheryl, about, well, if I have this specific certification or if I have this many years of experience and having that um, time for the employer to give you an idea of whether or not you were in their range. So you might look back at those resources. Oh, thank you, Carmen. I totally forgot that she did that. I think that would be on our YouTube um, channel. You're welcome. Well, the, I, I'm on a different computer, so my most updated resume <clears throat> is on a different computer. But here's just one. I, can you see it? Yes. So, yes. You see where I have that professional summary paragraph? I would, I would probably like, like my. Um, my transferable skills are, you know, facilitation, instructional design, training development. So I have it in my professional summary. But the one thing my resume doesn't have that we suggest now, and you'll see examples in, in, in the different workshops, is right under professional summary, I would have a section called keyword summary. And then I would probably have like four columns, probably like four columns, maybe four lines and i would say things like microsoft you know things that you really want to catch their eye um specific software programs and then these transferable skills that you that you have i tell you the best way to get your keyword summary is re read a lot of job descriptions and and use the same language the jobs that you're really attracted to the jo the job descriptions are going to overlap with the same sort of things like people that are looking for training and development people like me, they're going to have words like instructional design um, and, and um, how, how it's really important to know how to do PowerPoints and, you know, different, different tools that, that, that we use in the trade. And so you want to be speaking their language. So I, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't have a good example to show you, but but in between professional summary and professional experience would be this, what we call keyword summary. And it's just a list okay, of all right. skills. Perfect. So you're saying that we put those transferable skills in there. And they'll probably also Thank be you. part of your work history. You know, so you see all my bullet points um, after my various uh, job titles. They're, they're in there too. You might have a, a, a transferable skill mentioned three or four times, and that's okay. good because especially these software programs that look for the resume, like I, like I use Indeed when I was doing HR work. Um, you know, people use Monster, Career Builder. All, Zoom is a real uh, popular one now. I, no, not Zoom. ZipRecruiter. <laughs> this is Zoom. Uh, ZipRecruiter. I knew it started with a Z. And so what they do is the, the employer, you the employers put their job descriptions in these websites and the software goes and looks for the resumes that have the most, the most work. It's like a game almost who, who has the most hits, who, who says, uh, you know, like for instance, an accounting position, you know, is who says, you know, who has the most uh, accounting related words in their resumes. Those are going to float up to the top and the employer gets back a list of candidates ranked by how closely their resumes incorporated the same words as their job description. You want to be the Thank winner. you. You want to be the winner. Yes, thank you. Um, well, if that's all the questions, I think we'll wrap it up. Um, next week, or not next week, tomorrow's um, resumes, and then I'll send out the PowerPoint after this um, from Cheryl, and that will have the links to um, the assessments that you can do is that on the powerpoint um the websites um what one of the websites is on the powerpoint but the that checklist that i found at iupui i sent that to you as a link in an email to you but you're okay to find it there. thank you i'll include that as well and thank you so much cheryl and and you guys too I, when you get the powerpoint i apologize i put it together once i knew that we couldn't do this in person i just tried to real quickly grab the slides I could that were applicable and sometimes the the notes that are underneath are kind of repetitive because I wasn't really looking at those notes I was just trying to find some slides I wanted to show you 
So I'll, I'll just warn you that the, the, con the, 